Okay, I, I, um, now I suggested when I saw this uh, meeting was happening in Prague, I sent I sent along, hey, would you, you think people would be interested in this? I understand it's mostly a technical conference, so uh, you can say no if you're not interested, and I won't be offended. But I got the point. All right, I think people will be interested in this. So um, what I'm what I'm going to talk about today, and it's kind of interesting. Some of the things I say today will be jumping up and down. And maybe some of you will be jumping up and down too. Uh, because I'm not sure if this is a 100% pure and uh, in performance with the faith of the church. Um, but it is a pragmatic view of how we come to be one of the companies that is pure free software, all our software that we uh, sell and support is um, uh, GPL and various uh, modifications. And so I think a lot of people in the free software community are sort of interested in this important question. You know, is it possible to build companies, successful companies, based around free software? And at least I can give you one uh, success story here, give you some ideas of how we achieve that. Let's move on. Um, so a little bit about who Adencore is. Um, where we founded nearly 20 years ago. We're actually two companies, one in uh, New York, one in Paris, so we're together as a single unit. Oh, about 70 people between us now, this is quite a slight gap. And we uh, uh, built around, initially we were an ADA compiler company, now we're quite a bit more, still somewhat ADA centric, um, quite a bit ADA centric, but not exclusively ADA, not, certainly not exclusively a compiler company. So oh, let's uh, move on. So, uh, I say our original concentration was just native compilers, and now we're one of the leading native vendors, probably you could say the leading native vendor. Uh, we are, for example, the only company uh, that has implemented and distributed a new version of ADA, and only just now is even one of the companies distributing the 2005 version. So, very much in the forefront of ADA development. And um, I think it's fair to say that we're sort of leading ADA company. ADA itself, interesting, developed as a uh, general purpose language. It's found a niche now in uh, safety critical, uh, security critical, large scale systems. You know, an example, the new air traffic control system in the land based components of the new air traffic control system in England, 100% in ADA. That's an interesting story because it's also 100%. Uh, be subject to an interesting proof of practice techniques. And on the Dream Island, the 787, um, more, about half their avionic software is in ADA on that plane. And uh, historically, many other planes, both military and commercial, have used uh, ADA. So it's, it's, it's sits in this niche now. It's a pretty significant niche, but it's not, you know, it, it is a niche, it's not something that people use for uh, all the software they write. They thought that they have. Um, that's one. Um, so now we move, we support C and C, we support a rich set of tools for ADA development. And we have safety and security focus. Um, we deal with certification materials for avionics. Um, and we, uh, focus, we have a partnership with Praxis that focuses on use of formal verification <laughs> tools as part of the um, process of building uh, safe and reliable software. There's a huge increase in interest in security critical software. Um, one, of the, one of the points I've made in recent times is that any safety critical software is now security critical because if you have software where a bug can cause people to die, then obviously hacking that software by evil guys is worse. Uh, see any number of TV shows who uh, <laughs> It's actually what I said, uh, TV shows are interesting in a way because um, they're fiction, right? And I think uh, probably quite a few of you know Alias, a uh, 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 show that went by. There's one episode where Marshall is on the way mission and he's sitting on, because he actually has, he's one of these guys who can hack anything in instant time, and he actually has to be on site in England to hack it. And he's sitting in the plane and he's typing away on his laptop and then Captain has to be off laptop away said, so, oh, I just hacked into the avionic system and making sure the captain completed the safety checklist properly. <laughs> now, it's a funny laugh, but the question is, are those systems designed to be um, immune to that kind of uh, entry? Answer, no. I mean, I was involved in the 
certification of the triple seven, and security issues never came up. They do come up these days for obvious reasons. <laughs> so that's uh, the bad. And our customers are uh, the big guys, Boeing, <laughs> Airbus, Lockheed, uh, and the defense systems, uh, Raytheon. The, the, I would say, round up the usual suspects. Um, about half, a little, somewhat less than half our work is defense oriented, and the other half is some big projects. Uh, well, they're big government-related projects, at least like the, the air traffic control. I mean, there are some interesting outliers. Uh, the Canal Plus, their name has changed, I forgot this new name, is roughly the French equivalent of HBO, if you're from the US. It's, it does pay movies. And they do all their work using VMS and data. Uh, now, that's not exactly safety critical work, but um, they, it is a, an area where they demand total reliability. And I mean, if your system pumps out in the last five minutes of fatal attraction, no one might die. Well, someone might have a heart attack, I suppose. But, but uh, um, you have uh, 10 million very angry customers, and that's kind of scary. We have an interesting note. I'm just passing note. Because we have a disease in this uh, in the IT industry, which is to say that things disappear and have gone away and nobody uses them anymore. There are probably people in this room who believe that mainframes aren't in wide use anymore. Uh, I meet people like that all the time, you know, IBM raking in billions of dollars from main, mainframes every year and people think they've disappeared, it's amazing. Uh, people think cobalt's disappeared, amazing. <laughs> all sorts of things like that. So, VMS, people definitely think VMS has disappeared, well it hasn't. And uh, I have this conversation with people, I say, well, did you use VMS in the old days? Well, oh yeah, oh yeah. So, can you ever remember rebooting the system because it crashed? Well, isn't that a little bit interesting? <laughs> now you mentioned it, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> anyway, Edgar is in this sort of uh, bit of hiding kind of thing. And I think that's significant for what we talk about now, which is how the company works. That's the model. So our business model, we sell software. We do licenses, updates, support. Um, that's pretty much like the, uh, the big guys. Um, uh, we're a high-end product, intensive support. Complex large scale development systems and to get a pricing idea, a minimum pricing for support. We use those subscription models for support, is in the range of 20 million euros a uh, year. And that's you know, our smallest customers. Um, so, that's a little bit of history to fit on. So, how we present, uh, we use the term FOSS extensively. For us, it means freely licensed open source software. In a brief introduction, first talking to a customer, we tend to use the evil term open source. Uh, I think you would, you know, you've had this conversation before, and, and I would say, if anyone has that concern right now, wait and see for a little bit, because I'll talk about that more later. Um, it's familiar to people, and it's not a time of first contact to try and uh, reach the uh, also, free software, awful name in English. You're trying to sell people something, you say, well, first thing we want to tell you about our stuff is it's free. <laughs> that's a pretty confusing message to give. Um, so that's a real problem in terms of Freely licensed is a much better term for us to use in talking to customers. We emphasize convenience and utility to customers. Our message to customers is not ideological. We're not really in the ideology. Um, we're, we're not really in the ideology business, we're in the very pragmatic business of um, selling software supporting our customers' needs. It's a different uh, uh, viewpoint. So this is a slide from, uh, from an introductory, it's only 15 slide presentation to customers for the bar. So this is just one slide, it's so the open source advantage. Source code is included, very important thing for uh, practical use. No messing with locks and license managers and crap like that, which is a huge pain for commercial customers. No limits on the number of installs. No nonsense like that. So very much a pragmatic message of uh, convenience rather than a sort of ideological um, message. And that's about what we would say on the first uh, You have to remember that open source in a commercial environment uh, brings all kinds of concerns. You know, people think uh, there's going to be all kinds of evil stuff hidden in 
why they think that evil stuff can hide in open software more than it can hide in closed software is bizarre to me. I mean, look, the first version of Excel, I assume it's gone now, had a full featured flight emulator in it. Well, how did they get there? I, mean, I can't believe someone I have in Microsoft said, we desperately need a flight emulator uh, um, accessible by hidden secret key sequence in Excel. No, someone put it there for fun. You yeah, wouldn't get away with that in our community, right? Someone said it's an explosive to do that with GCC. We're serious people. We don't do that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I found it very interesting that people somehow think that that's uh, this advantage of open sources that you can uh, be contaminated with uh, stuff like that. And the other thing is they're very worried about this. Look, these guys go in and uh, break it up. They're not in the open, they're not in the free software business. Sorry to disappoint you. Uh, many of them are writing highly classified stuff. And they are afraid that somehow the GPL is going to make them have force them to release all their software uh, or the source of their software. Now that's nonsense, but it's nonsense that is promoted, it's a nonsense idea that is promoted by lots of people, including people in the software, free software community. The GPL, let me say this now and I'll say it later again, the GPL never forces you to release anything to anyone under any circumstances. It's a good rule to know, although it's a surprise to me. Let's flip on. So we used a subscription model. We did that. We made that decision very early on, 20 years ago. It's become much more standard now. The constant standard payment. Oh, we typically start with a one-year contract. And it's renewed yearly. If the customer wants to, and we, our license is in perpetual, so don't play the login game. You know, like, say, um, a quick and plays, which is you, want, you better get a new version quicker because we're not going to support the old one anymore and your stuff won't work anymore. And uh, besides, the license is, is, uh, will expire. So people are free to say, okay, I don't need your support to get lost and uh, no, we'll continue to work, use the software. Um, we specifically avoid the payout front model, which is really, in practice, the take the money and run model because most software companies, you know, they're interested in grabbing your money up front. Yes, they have to provide some kind of support, but it's kind of a minimal thing, it's not their focus. And you know, if, if, if you find your uh, Windows software not working completely, good luck trying to call Microsoft support and getting some help. You know, theoretically you have that support, good luck trying to get any useful out of it. Um, over a long time, we're a rather expensive solution, but the customer's not committed to this in advance. So let's flip on. Now, I have to say, the interesting thing about this uh, pricing model is that it aligns the interests of customers and the company. Now, you can companies say all kinds of nice things to you about the wonderful things they're going to do for you, um, but it's not terribly believable unless it's in their interest to follow through. Now, the way our, our commercial model works is you buy a year's license uh, support from us with support. We better give you worthwhile support, worthwhile updates, blah, 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 or you're not going to renew. We will be successful as a company if you renew. It's up to you whether you renew. We better give you good service. I mean, I think we must be one of the few companies where if you don't use our support services for three months, alarms sound and we send people out saying, how come you're not using our support services? Well, we know the answer to that. Most people are used to the idea that software support is totally useless and something you might use in an accident last minute emergency, but not otherwise. We have to convince people that we're there to help. And after a while, people understand. They get their message that's a little bit hard to understand. It's easier to send a message to us than go looking in the documentation. I mean, who reads documentation anyway? Useless, right? Uh, we produce all we put all this effort into producing pilot documentation, but uh, nobody reads it, uh, or very few people read it. Um, so, customers need to be educated on the value of support. And for us, support is the main focus. Not the only focus, we're not selling just support, but certainly a main focus. You know, one thing you can't do if you're selling um, free software is what? Uh, it's called bottom feeding in the industry. And that means you just stop developing your software and uh, you fire all your developers and you just keep drawing in money from people who are kind of committed to the software. And you can keep going years for, for years for that, breaking the money. That, you can't do that. It's, if you're not providing obvious value, people will not pay you money for it. And I like that balance of interest. So it's our, in our interest to make the customers want to renew. We have very high renewal rates, which is key, key to our business. That's a lot of um, I like to do everything in this, but I just say we don't have a support stuff because
because all our principal developers, uh, their primary job is support. All our developers are uh, in constant contact with customers all the time. That's an interesting model. Most companies have a wall of big incompetent idiots whose job is to protect their development people from the annoying consumers of their software. And you know, that you reach, if you send us a support message, it reaches all our support staff uh, immediately. And nearly all our support staff has gone out on sales calls and pre-sales calls to customers. But we have a lot of contact. And I actually think that's, and technical people like that contact. It's great to work with, it's great to work with users who are using your software and are enthusiastic about it. Uh, I'm sure that's one of the reasons why you look at the American company and we've had one person left the company after working 14 years, a friend of mine left uh, a few weeks ago, and I, we had a going away bar, a party for him. I said, Well, you know, we have a very small budget for going away party, so they thought, Luckily, we have 18 years worth saved up. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, move on. Um, we have a huge test suite. Test suites work particularly well with compilers, they don't work so well with fighter aircraft. You know, you can't sort of <laughs> run or nuclear bombs or something like that. You can't run nightly tests on your nuclear bombs. But you can run new nightly tests on compilers. And that is the one thing in our system which is hugely proprietary. Why? We have millions of lines of proprietary code from our customers. They're very free in giving it to us. Other non disclosure agreements, uh, that of course mean that you can't have that test code. We do file with pretty. Uh, um, careful to file small test programs with the FSF when we make corrections. But we can't file the good stuff, which is million line applications from Boeing, which we run like, in fact, we run important like, you can't make a single change to the system without running our full test suite, which these days is getting faster and faster than the faster machines. So let's, uh, uh, all our tools are uh, GPL free. Um, and that itself is a front end for GCC. Um, we benefit from the huge amount of work on GCC. In particular, we support more targets and more combinations of our uh, technology than we have people, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but it's a tribute to GCC. GCC has achieved what people had in mind 30 years ago, which is you know, one compiler with multiple front ends, multiple back ends. And it's an extraordinary success uh, story that GCC has achieved. For example, the IA64. Deadly difficult machine to generate code for, so deadly difficult is part of the reason the chip fails. But um, we can support the IA64 immediately. We, uh, we did uh, contracts, th three contracts for HP to get um, uh, IA64 supporting um, their various operating systems. And we have this back end on which millions of dollars was uh, invested. Uh, <laughs> Libre site for people developing free software. 
So let's uh, move on. Um, I'll just summarize this. We work very closely with the FSF. Uh, we contribute our changes back to the FSF. Um, and we have, uh, we're one of the companies. If yeah, you look at all the work that's done on GCC, a lot of that work is done by full-time engineers paid by major companies like IBM Red Hat. Uh, not, and some, some work is done by volunteers who are working every time. But the majority of the work is done by people who work full-time. And we're very much in that category. Um, the comments, the NACRO releases are based on a stabilized version of GCC, typically with a fairly extensive version of patches. I mean, one problem with GCC is that it moves rapidly. So there's always an issue of uh, what version you capture exactly and what state is that version in. But well, part of the added value of a company like ours is, is to stabilize a version and test it thoroughly and move to a new stable version only after extensive testing. And that's, that's one of the services we provide. That's Steam on. So that's a little about Libra size and the GPL version um, where anyone can download four versions technology with sources of course and um, that very much encourages use in universities um, we have a big program of providing not only the software but free full support for universities um, the academic, academic program there are about uh, several hundred I don't know the latest count several hundred universities are enrolling in a gap a criteria for that is they use either in their curriculum somewhere um, we, so we're, one of the purposes to use is dual licensing. And it's always interesting if you can always distribute, the new software can be distributed under multiple licenses if you own the copyright. And we, um, if you are the original copyright holder, I should say. So on, the, on this, uh, if you download software from the site, better not include it in your uh, um, fighter aircraft or you're in big trouble, you have a copyright violation on your um, That's Skip off. Now, this is something you always say. So, good people get the FSF version. I mean, we do a pretty up to date version of our technology at the FSF always. Well, they could, it's easy to do so. So, they come packaged with many free uh, distributions. So, if you get, get a distribution of or something like that, that will have a version, some version of that. Yeah. Um, but the commercial use of all this script. There are, company like, there, are, there are big companies that have policies that say, fine to use open source software, usually they will call it that, but providing you have a commercial um, support license. Companies are very worried about their engineers downloading unknown miscellaneous stuff from who knows where onto uh, who knows what machines locally without knowing whether the licensing terms are appropriate, etc. And that is a real fair concern for a large company. So many large companies just have policies prohibiting that kind of free download. It doesn't work, of course, people have that kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, in practice, almost all commercial development with Canadians are using supporting that open us. Not all, we have a couple of people who are um, using uh, public versions from various places. But generally, that's a general. And for most people, the support's easily worth the price of admission. You know, when I say something at like 20k a year, it's not for software price, a lot of money. Compare it to the salary of one programmer, and it's nothing, right? So, uh, in terms of burden salaries for the program. So, if you have a big team of people, 100 people working on a project, uh, the cost of uh, software screwing up is huge. And uh, so, uh, if nothing else, uh, the support's kind of an uh, insurance policy. Um, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about the whole issue of commercial, I'll take this first, commercial versus open source, commercial versus fast, is a bogus juxtaposition. Uh, we're a commercial company, we're, at, we're in the business of making money, I mean we have to, we don't have to get rich like uh, 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 Bill Gates, but we do have to put food on the table and pay decent salaries to get good people, you know, that. so we need to make money. Um, so we're a commercial company, I mean, not apologetic for that. Um, there's a huge confusion about what open source and free software means. And I have a talk that I standardly give to companies about free software versus open source. Now, if, if Richard gave this talk, free software versus open source, it would be more of an ideological talk on, on a very different ideology.
colleges involved. This is more of a pragmatic talk, so uh, as I said, not really in the ideology business primarily. Let's flip off. Um, so open source is a relatively new term, and it's really about um, encouraging open development. I'm using not you know Richard's imagination, which is very accurate, people's misinterpretation, but the actual meaning of open source, which is this project we encourage open development. Well, is that good or bad? For our companies, for, I'm, I'm thinking of buying software. Is it good or bad that it's being developed in an open software environment? Hard to say. There are arguments both ways. And in fact, the real bottom line is there's junk open source software, and there's good open source software, and there's junk proprietary software, and there's good proprietary software. It's really too old and, and, and anyway, as Richard says, you know, we had this conversation, you don't, how software is developed is not the issue. The issue is whether the software does the job you need it to do. Uh, how do you find that out? Do you uh, call your friendly company and say, hello, does your software do this that we need? Oh, good, thank you very much. No, 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 no. You have a team of people evaluating the software and seeing whether it does what you want. And uh, how it was developed is secondary from that point of view. So let's uh, uh, go. Now, free software is something completely different. Um, because yeah, this is what we're going to do here. It's about freedom for users and presented in the right way. It's totally a plus, but it does need some presentation. That's a uh, scheme on it. Okay. Um, so let's move on. Next slide. I just mentioned that open systems is a very popular term in the industry. It means something completely different to me. Uh, it means a system built for components with well defined open that are free from patent or copyright in common formats and interfaces. Um, for instance, uh, we're up in those movie formats, a good example of a proprietary format, um, which, you, which is not very unfree and very worrisome. Um, let's flip a little bit. Um, a real open system is one that really adheres to the philosophy of openness throughout the system. And the middle of is a, a classic system. I love the example of the positive subsystem for NT. NT is built over a kernel whose uh, interface is secret. It's one of uh, Microsoft's most closely held secrets. I mean, the EU has um, managed to force Microsoft to reveal some of the details, but not much. And um, you can have different subsystems on it. So everyone, Windows is just one of many subsystems on a Windows kernel. Well, nonsense. There is only one subsystem that anyone's interested in. But they built a POSIX subsystem. It can't communicate with Windows or do anything useful except pass the POSIX tests. And the US Navy says, great, Windows runs the POSIX test successfully, stamp, uh, authorized open system. And now they use it uh, on all their, on many of their ships, they use Windows, including the uh, wonderful case of the frigate, which was launched and 50 miles out from port, blue screen on every, uh, <laughs> and they input the system, blue screen on every screen of the thing, and so they have to tow it back to port for the uh, time, and they commence, and they do a big investigation. Uh, no problem, they have discovered that one of the applications programs had made an improper call to the operating system, so clearly it was 100% responsibility of that uh, application program, and the operating system was uh, uh, called uh, error free. No. <laughs> What? No, what is implying blue screen? <laughs> uh, so the, the, Navy, uh, the Navy is an interesting uh, an interesting Let's go on. So free software versus open system, open source. Well, the important freedom for free software is freedom to modify, which means that sources are available. So as, um, as Richard said, very often the, the terms become pretty close and split on. Um, so, as I said, open source is not really an important issue for the users. I mean, it does open, does open the sources contribute to security? Interesting discussion. Plus, everyone can see the bugs. All the good guys can see the bugs and uh, fix them. Minus, all the bad guys can see the bugs and exploit them. Which is more important? No, it does. Interesting. It's a, one, it's a very interesting ongoing discussion. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, uh, presume to give a solution. Let's uh, flip on. So, uh, free license, free software doesn't guarantee quality, um, but it, it's, um, the user can, you can do, compare free software with Microsoft software, you can 
can do everything you can do with Microsoft software and some more. That can't be a bad thing, right? Well, that's almost true. Let's flip on. So, a little bit about how we pair with Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft sells exclusive proprietary programs for extreme devices. We sell programs covered by a free software license. So that's completely different, right? It's much more similar than you think. And this is a message for lawyers as well as for users. Uh, so we both do the same thing. We sell software with support, it's copyrighted by the license that allows you limited rights to copy the software, and you pay for the combination of the software support and appropriate license. So what's the difference? Interesting question. You know, remember that you're really you're dealing with lawyers who are scary this stuff. So emphasizing that it's that they can analyze it in terms of familiar with this isn't about which that's so. Uh, the only difference is the license. Well, other license is pretty different. And the license is confusing because of the preamble, which is, you know, the preamble of the license is more of an ideological statement of purity than uh, a legal document. It's not really part of the license. It's designed to worry people in some sense. Uh, the end of the license is fun, a little bit has few restrictions that they want. So, Anything that the license, and same thing I said, every Microsoft license allows the Apple license allows to do. So, tip on. Um, well, there are some things you can't do. Um, Richard, a nice description of why copy left is there, so prevent, them, prevent those uh, things that you don't want people to do. Um, and if you do distribute modified versions um, and include them in your software, uh, you must use the GPL for that distribution and include the sources and your modifications, which is what worries people, of course, so onto the point. So people have heard that GPLs are virus. <laughs> Evil virus. You put a little bit of GPL on your software and something. The whole software is covered by the GPL. That's complete nonsense. It's not what the license says. Um, let's look at the facts and see. Um, suppose you obtain the sources, you modify them, and you distribute the modified version. Well, we can flip ahead without going through the details, but basically these, these slides say Microsoft gets uh, hugely alarmed and uh, the C report and the uh, uh, you know, that costs lots of money. And what do we say? We say, well, you know, it, it's like opening your iPod. It kind of uh, uh, violates the support guarantee because we can't support anything you arbitrarily modify. But we'll do our best to help. And, you know, Make sure you've got the sources and provide you some limited help in building the thing and so on. And it's certainly perfectly fine and distributed, providing you, you uh, follow the rules. But well, this is quite a bit more liberal than the uh, Microsoft response. Let's flip ahead. Okay, I understand I'm not a compiler, and that's fine. I'm not a compiler business. I'm not a plan to uh, modify the compiler anyway. But I'm really worried about the runtime. Don't my programs include some of your runtime? And the answer is yes, they do. And that's why we have this GPL with, um, uh, with exceptions, which is incidentally much more clearly laid out in, with GPL 3 than it was with GPL 2. GPL 2 has some real legal problems with that exception. Uh, GPL 3, that's all solved. Um, so even if you don't modify your program and include such a library, it would be included by the GPL. And that, of course, wouldn't be acceptable. So one of the things you're buying from April is the assurance that all the runtime libraries are properly licensed, so that is not an issue. Okay. So, you always have to worry about the licenses. I mean, I, if people say, is there any danger in the um, 3D license open source software? Yes, there is a significant danger. It's one of lack of education. People think, oh, great, all this free stuff, I can use it anywhere I like. No, you can't. For example, the Sigwin library that you get free from Red Hat is GPL. You can't include that in your program without being uh, in trouble. So let's uh, flip ahead. So the IPA license is guaranteed. Uh, this is one of the important things that people can't ask for is these kind of license guarantees. We uh, provide a simple and clear license statement as part of our guarantees that there are these kind of problems. Let's flip ahead. So the GMG is the license that allows that modification. I'll make all these slides available. So now, dangers of 
plots? Well, the first danger that people have in mind is that someone will somehow force them to reveal all their sources. They're complete nonsense, and uh, I'll discuss that in a slide. Uh, you should have supported an unreliable software. Yes, that's a danger. You know, that it's a major wherever the source software comes. You're a big company having uh, some engineer load some piece of software that only he knows about and use it is a liability. You have to worry about that. Um, improper inclusion of GPL software and products. Uh, that's a real issue. You have to, that has to be cured by uh, good education of your uh, people. And the risks in distributing, distributing GPL software. You, well, we have slides on each of these. Let's go ahead. So automatic muscle, uh, I, I, unless I make these slides available, this might be one of the most important slides. The GPL can never force you to distribute anything under any circumstances ever. I said that at the beginning of the talk and I said it again now. People think that if I distribute, if I, let's suppose I accidentally include some GPL software by software, I distribute it. Uh, can the FSF come and demand that you uh, open source your thing? Of course they can't. They can't force you to issue a life, a GPL license to anyone. What's the situation? The situation is you have a copyright infringement on your hand. And what happens on a copyright infringement? Well, if, you, if someone was feeling vindictive, they could go and charge, you know, collect huge damages for the... But mostly the interest is in solving the thing. I mean, in a, in a real copyright case, you, would, uh, you would deal with the damages and then you deal with mitigating for the future. And the normal way of mitigating is to remove the offending software from your distribution. And that would be the normal thing that people would do in the case of GPL software. They have the option of saying, never mind, you know, I'm going to uh, uh, open source my uh, nuclear power plant uh, uh, control <laughs> power and, uh, and so it won't be violating in the future. They have that option. They are unlikely to take that option. <laughs> so it's only an option. And, but once lawyers understand that, that's a huge burden out of the way, is that there's no danger of being forced to lose IP, and, and uh, the issue of being careful about copyright is no different in this case than what they're used to. This is a really important slide, because the trouble is we have big companies, uh, uh, the company name, one company name might begin with M and be on the west coast of the US, which has a real interest in confusing you on this topic. And uh, I don't know if you have, uh, oh, who's read the Halloween 1 and 2 documents in this room? Oh, not so many. So you must look up these documents. So you'll find them uh, if you Google them. Microsoft Halloween 1 and 2. Halloween 1 document says, open source is a real danger. What are we going to do about it? Answer, we're going to, uh, first of all, alert everyone to the dangers of using open source software. And second, we're going to proprietarize the uh, interfaces. Halloween 2. Mm. That didn't work so well. <laughs> We've got a lot of bad publicity from that. How about instead we emphasize deep pocket support and we emphasize the support that we can provide for our software? We, we quite like Halloween too. It, uh, <laughs> we found that. But uh, those documents are worth reading. They're supposedly leaked documents from inside our software. And it's interesting to know who leaked. Let's uh, skip ahead. I'm coming. So, um, so this is just about being very careful that you don't, you educate your people not to use uh, copyrighted software. And you educate them that free software doesn't mean it's, it, they can use it freely. Um, so there's a real, um, there's a real education issue that needs to be addressed. And that's a good ahead. And that's a good ahead because we need to talk about that. Um, if you, you're allowed to redistribute uh, GPL software. That doesn't mean it's a good idea. Whenever you distribute software, you acquire legal liabilities. Uh, some of them will shock you. And, uh, so in a big company, you probably, you know, I had this discussion with Navy, Navy uh, with an open source guy named. Oh, you know, our lawyers have told us that if we redistribute GPL software, we could acquire some uh, uh, significant legal liabilities. Your lawyers are completely correct. Why would you distribute uh, copies of it? The, the Navy is not in the charge in the business of distributing software. Why would you distribute this stuff? I think there's a policy saying you won't do it. And always remember, a right, is, does, a right under a license does not have to be exercised. And you need, as a company, to have certain policies over what rights you will or will not uh, uh, exercise. 
So that's um, the bad. Warranty is, this slide is just about warranties being well thought of. Um, I mean, free software can have warranties, um, proprietary software can have warranties. Most software has no warranties, you know, you're, they warrant the uh, uh, DVD or which is free, but not much else. Um, but uh, some software comes with real warranties, and some of that is in fact uh, free software. That's the one. So, um, the first conclusion is that really is a third one I think is important, is the education is important. I have spent a lot of time talking to lawyers, and in every case, once we have this kind of conversation, spun out in more detail, of course, the lawyers have been able to be comfortable. Yes, there are no special liabilities here, um, but I've emphasized that they should really worry about education and that people should understand these issues to avoid uh, problems. That's um, the beginning. So, now, bottom line, uh, we're a successful commercial company. <coughs> Cost 